Mishnah, we turn now to the second topic of this fourth round of public hearings. The second topic we will examine involves issues that arise in the interactions between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in regional and remote communities and financial services entities. As at 2016, 649,171 Australians identified as being of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander origin, comprising 2.8% of the total population of Australia. Whilst the majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in New South Wales and Queensland, the Northern Territory has the highest proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with 25.5% of the Northern Territory population identifying themselves in this way. For this reason, and because a number of our case studies this week will involve witnesses from the Northern Territory, the Commission has chosen to hold this second week of hearings in Darwin. As with the other topic explored in this round of hearings, the Commission has consulted widely in order to identify and understand the issues that arise for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with financial services entities. We'll provide further detail of this consultation later in this opening statement. The structure of this opening statement is as follows. First, we will explore some of the obstacles to accessing financial products and services that are experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional communities. Second, we will identify what the Commission has been told by representatives of those people and by the regulator about the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with financial services entities, including with particular financial products and services that are the subject of the case studies explored in these hearings. Third, we will identify the particular financial products and bank practices that are the subject of our case studies and will explain some of the key features of the legal framework governing those financial products and practices. Fourth, we will summarise what financial services entities have told the Commission about their practices relating to their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. Finally, we will briefly address the nature of the evidence that will be given over the remainder of this week by providing an overview of the case studies that we will examine. We turn first to obstacles encountered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in regional and remote communities when accessing financial products and services. Before doing so, we note that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population is as diverse as the broader Australian population, and not all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in these communities will experience the obstacles that we will outline. As we explained last Monday in our opening address for this fourth round of hearings, as at the 30th of June last year, around 6.9 million people, or around 28% of Australia's population, lived in regional or remote areas. Of all people living in remote areas, there is a significant proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In 2011, 45% of people living in very remote areas and 16% of people living in remote areas identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. As at June last year, only 4% of all branches of ADIs in Australia were located in remote or very remote areas. Only 7% of face-to-face -face services provided by ADIs were provided in remote or very remote areas. And finally, only 2% of ATMs in Australia were located in remote or very remote areas. In general terms, access to a bank branch, other face-to-face -face services and ATMs decreases as remoteness increases. A lack of access to appropriate and affordable financial services and products is often referred to as financial exclusion. Financial exclusion is frequently graded on a scale. Three indicators of financial inclusion, which are used as markers on this scale, 
are whether a person holds a transaction account, a credit card and general insurance. People who hold all three of these are considered fully financially included. People holding two of the three are considered marginally financially excluded and people holding one of the three are considered severely financially excluded, with people holding none of the three fully financially excluded. Research done by the Centre for Social Impact between 2006 and 2013 indicated that women, young adults and those living in capital cities were more likely to be severely or fully financially excluded. However, the Centre for Social Impact's research also found that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians were overrepresented in the severely or fully financially excluded group. The research found that Indigenous Australians were around twice as likely as non-Indigenous Australians to be financially excluded. The Commission will hear evidence in these hearings from people who work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about the factors leading to financial exclusion. Three important factors are financial literacy, geographic exclusion of people living in regional and remote Australia, and difficulties in providing the required identity documents to receive financial services. We will say more about each of these three factors, dealing firstly with financial literacy. Fundamental barriers can exist for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in accessing financial services, including language barriers, where English is not spoken as a first language, lower levels of financial literacy, and limited exposure to people with high levels of financial literacy. A 2015 study by Gordon and Boyle notes that lower levels of literacy are present among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly those from regional and remote communities where children have only participated in formal education in relatively recent generations. The study also found that lower levels of literacy and numeracy disproportionately impact on the financial exclusion levels of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are continuously overrepresented in this category. Consumers with low financial literacy may have a limited understanding of how credit, insurance and superannuation products work. This may result in inappropriate products being provided to consumers. We turn to geographic exclusion which refers to a physical lack of access to banking and financial services due to the distance between where the consumer lives and the required services. In the 2016 census, almost one in five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people lived in remote and very remote areas, compared to around one in 100 non-Indigenous people. By virtue of their location, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are more likely than the general population to suffer geographic financial exclusion. For all Australians, and particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, geographic exclusion can be further compounded by a range of other practices and developments. We will highlight three of these. Bank branch closures, ATM fees and access to digital services. Dealing first with bank branch closures, in recent years there has been a reduction in bank branches and other face-to-face -face points of presence in these communities. The Commission heard in the first part of this hearing about the substantial number of branch closures in rural and remote areas of Australia over the last decade. The removal of banking services from remote communities has had particular implications for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, who represent a large and increasing share of the population of regional and remote Australia. The ABA's bank closure protocol recognises that losing a nearby branch may have implications for the local community, particularly for those who live a significant distance away from a branch. The protocol identifies the steps that should be taken by a bank if it is closing a branch 
and there is not another branch of the same brand within 20 kilometres by road. In those circumstances, the protocol proposes that where it is commercially viable to do so, a bank closing a branch will ensure that ongoing face-to-face -face access remains locally available. If it is not commercially viable to continue to offer face-to-face -face services, the protocol provides that the bank will undertake to identify other retail banking service options <coughs> prior to bank closure and commence consultation with the community. Turning to ATM fees, a lack of access to bank branches and to alternative methods of withdrawing cash may result in people living in regional and remote areas paying relatively high transaction costs to obtain cash. These transaction costs are largely referable to ATM fees. In a 2010 report, the Australian Financial Counselling and Credit Reform Association noted that the cost of ATM fees was having a significant and detrimental impact on Indigenous people living in remote communities. This was due to withdrawal limits on ATMs, which forced people who needed larger amounts to make multiple withdrawals, incur incurring additional fees. It was also due to Indigenous consumers having no choice but to use the single ATM in a remote community that charges fees to perform transactions or check account balances, and due to community stores charging fees of $2 per FPOS transaction. In response to concerns raised about the impact of ATM fees, the government announced in December 2010 that the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Treasury would establish a joint task force to monitor and enhance ATM competition reforms. In May 2012, the ABA applied to the ACCC for authorisation of a proposed agreement pursuant to which customers of the proposed participating financial institutions would be provided with access to fee-free ATM withdrawals and balance inquiries at certain ATMs operated by the proposed participating ATM deployers. On the 8th of November 2012, the ACCC granted authorisation for five years to the 1st of December 2017. On the 21st of December last year, the ACCC granted reauthorisation for a further 10 years. Turning to access to digital services, as the physical distance to financial products and services increases, Access to the internet and other digital services becomes increasingly important to facilitate dealings with financial products and services. Access to the internet and online banking services may alleviate some of the difficulties in accessing financial services when access to a branch or an ATM is limited. However, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in remote communities may have difficulty accessing the internet as it may be unavailable or costly. Other factors that impact on the ability of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to adapt to electronic banking systems include language barriers, levels of education, literacy, technical literacy and unreliable phone or internet access. We turn to the third important contributor to financial exclusion. As well as financial literacy and geographic exclusion, difficulties with identification documents can play a major role. As we have noted, the Centre for Social Impact has done significant work on financial exclusion. In a piece of work from 2012, considering people who were fully or severely excluded <coughs> from access to financial services. The centre found that 17.9% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people surveyed had difficulties in opening a bank account because they were unable to provide identity documents, compared with 8.7% of non-Indigenous people in the survey. The Commission will hear from people representing bodies that work closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consumers about the reasons such people have difficulty with identification documents. 
We highlight some of those reasons now. In 2015, the Indigenous Superannuation Working Group found that identification problems occur because for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly older generations, births, marriages and deaths were not recorded in official registers. The result of this is that some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consumers do not have a birth certificate. If their birth was never recorded, it can be very difficult to obtain a birth certificate. Some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consumers have or use multiple names. These may include a traditional skin name or clan name, a birth name and an adoptive name. Formal identification documents may contain different names or different spellings of the same name. It can be very difficult to have documents copied or certified in remote locations. Some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live many hours away from the nearest bank branch, making it difficult to physically attend a branch to provide identification documents. Financial exclusion has a number of potential consequences. Amongst other things, financial exclusion makes day-to-day -day money management difficult, reducing people's ability to buffer against unexpected financial shocks or to smooth consumption. Financial exclusion can mean that individuals who lack identification documents may have difficulty opening a bank account, accessing superannuation entitlements and accessing mainstream credit. Financial exclusion also increases the likelihood that a consumer will resort to methods of obtaining finance beyond mainstream credit providers. As a result of being excluded from mainstream credit options, consumers may have few alternatives other than to turn to high cost, small amount lenders to source finance as quickly as possible from the first available lender at whatever cost and on whatever terms are offered. In 2015, the Centre for Social Inclusion noted that when compared to the broader population or financially included segment between 2006 and 2013, people who were severely or fully financially excluded were consistently more likely to experience a number of poorer economic, social and health outcomes. Amongst other things, those who were severely or fully financially excluded were more likely to feel financially unstable. It is clear that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face unique obstacles to participation in financial services in remote and regional communities. We will hear evidence in these hearings about the significant consequences of financial exclusion for these people. We turn next to some of the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in respect of the products and practices that we will address in these <coughs> hearings. The Commission has consulted with a large number of bodies that provide assistance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with or disputes with financial services entities. The Commission has spoken with financial counsellors and lawyers from organisations across Australia who work closely with this group. In the Northern Territory, we spoke with the Catherine, Central Australia and Darwin offices of the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency, NAJA, and with representatives of Save the Children in Catherine. In Queensland, we spoke to the Indigenous Consumer Assistance Network, ICANN, including with financial counsellors who work with consumers on Palm Island. In Victoria, we spoke to the Consumer Action Law Centre. In New South Wales, we spoke with the Financial Rights Legal Centre and New South Wales Legal Aid. We also spoke with representatives of Financial Counselling Australia across the country, including its affiliates at Broome Circle in Western Australia, Anglicare Northern Territory, located in Darwin, and Lutheran Community Care, located in Central Australia. We spoke with financial counsellors who work with clients in a number of remote communities across Australia, including Groot Island, 
and Lake Abella in the Top End and the Ulamu community in Central Australia. In addition, we spoke with the First Nations Foundation who work across Australia. These bodies told the Commission about the key issues facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with financial services entities, some of which were common across a number of these organisations. The first common issue that the Commission heard about related to funeral insurance. Consumer bodies told the Commission about predatory sales practices of funeral insurance companies and about the provision of inappropriate policies to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We were told that funeral insurance policies were often unsuitable to the consumer base. The second common issue related to superannuation. The Commission heard about a number of difficulties experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in relation to accessing superannuation funds. We heard that these people sometimes lack the necessary knowledge about their superannuation benefits and entitlements in order to make a claim. When they are aware of those entitlements, we heard that they often still have difficulty accessing entitlements due to the identification requirements and issues associated with remoteness. We were told that there can be a lack of acknowledgement within superannuation funds of Indigenous kinship structures, meaning that consumers are unable to elect beneficiaries beyond their immediate family. The third common issue related to consumer lending. We were told about instances of irresponsible lending that bore a number of similarities to consumer experiences that we examined in the first round of Commission hearings in circumstances that involved the added challenges of remoteness, language and cultural barriers. We heard that clients face problems with a range of consumer credit products, including car loans, credit cards, consumer leases, particularly those taken out to obtain essential household items, such as furniture and white goods, payday loans and in-store credit arrangements, including the practice of book up. Book up is a practice by which a supplier allows a customer to run up a tab and to pay for the goods or services later. Commissioner, we will not be considering consumer leases, payday loans or in-store credit arrangements in these hearings because they do not fall within the terms of reference of the Commission. This is because, generally speaking, the entities providing consumer credit under those arrangements do not fall within the definition of a financial services entity in the terms of reference. Most relevantly for present purposes, those entities are generally not authorised deposit-taking institutions, nor entities which are required under the Corporations Act to hold an Australian financial services licence. <coughs> the fourth issue uh, identified by the groups with which we spoke related to banking fees and, proceed and practices. We were told about issues associated with informal overdraft facilities and high dishonour and overdrawn fees, ATM fees associated with withdrawing cash and checking account balances appeared to be a particular concern in remote Aboriginal communities. We were also told about difficulties in meeting the identification requirements for opening a bank account. We were told that a significant amount of financial counsellors' time is occupied by assisting clients to verify their identity with financial services entities. We also sought information from ASIC about what it considered to be issues of particular concern affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with financial services entities. ASIC told us that it receives information and complaints about issues affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from four main sources. Complaints received by ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program in the course of undertaking outreach work. Complaints received by ASIC's Indigenous Telephone and Email Helpline. Complaints received by ASIC's Misconduct and Breach Reporting Team. And through stakeholder networks of Indigenous consumer advocates, 
financial counsellors, community legal centres and other government agencies. ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program is a national team which undertakes surveillance and compliance activities, works with ASIC's enforcement teams to pursue enforcement action, works with the Money Smart team to produce financial literacy materials for Indigenous <coughs> consumers and undertakes project and policy work to improve the provision of financial services for Indigenous consumers. ASIC told the Commission that it has identified a number of issues in relation to the provision of funeral insurance policies to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Since the 1st of January 2008, ASIC has received 37 complaints from consumers who identify as Indigenous or who were identified by their representative as Indigenous relating to funeral products. The particular issues raised were the use of inappropriate sales practices when selling funeral insurance to Indigenous consumers, 26 of the incidents, including misrepresentations and pressure selling tactics, and the sale of funeral insurance policies to Indigenous consumers in circumstances where the policy may be of little benefit to the policy holder, such as sales to Indigenous people under 20 years of age. ASIC identified that while over half of consumers with funeral insurance were aged 50 to 74, this was 51.2%, funeral insurance sold to Indigenous consumers had a much younger age profile. 50% were aged under 20. A higher proportion of Indigenous consumers also had their policies cancelled for non-payment of premiums. ASIC has taken action against at least three funeral and life insurance providers in respect of their sales to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. Two of these funeral insurance providers, ACBF and Select, will be the subject of case studies during these hearings. ASIC also told the Commission that it believes a significant number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have difficulty engaging with the superannuation system. ASIC told us that it received feedback from financial counsellors and consumer advocates through its consumer advisory panel about unmet needs among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for information about superannuation, proof of identity requirements and tax file number issues. The feedback that it received also related to difficulties with accessing superannuation funds and finding lost super. ASIC told us that it has held information forums with representatives of the superannuation industry to raise awareness about the issues Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face when accessing their superannuation. ASIC has also arranged trips to Indigenous communities with senior people from some superannuation funds. ASIC also told the Commission that many remote Indigenous communities are not serviced by ADIs or by networks or intermediaries to connect ADIs with potential borrowers. ASIC explained that it is common in remote communities for credit to be provided by the vendor of the goods, including through book-up arrangements. ASIC told us that it has worked with regional Indigenous communities in relation to loans and credit products and that this work has primarily been directed towards providers of book-up and consumer leases for household goods. ASIC told the Commission that consumer advocates have notified it of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients who spend significant proportions of their income on bank fees. In particular, the lack of services and choice of ATMs means that fees for withdrawals and balance checking are frequently unavoidable. ASIC participated in a task force with Treasury and the Reserve Bank in 2010 to 2011. As a result of a report produced by that task force, the ABA implemented the fee-free ATM <coughs> response, which we referred to earlier. This involved the provision of 84 ATMs by certain banks across very remote communities at which cash withdrawals and balance inquiries could be made without charge. 
ASIC told the Commission that the fee-free ATM trial has significantly reduced the impact of transaction fees in communities where a fee-free ATM is located. A number of the issues raised by ASIC and by those bodies that provide assistance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will be considered in this round of hearings. In particular, the Commission will examine case studies involving funeral insurance and bank fees and practices. Immediately after this opening, tomorrow morning, we will hear from a representative of ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program and a representative of Financial Counselling Australia, who will provide further information about some of the issues faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities in dealings with financial services entities. We turn now to the particular financial products and practices of financial services entities that we will examine in these hearings. In this part of our opening address, we will also outline some key aspects of the legal framework that relate to the subject of our case studies. The first product which we will consider in the case studies is funeral insurance. Funeral products assist consumers to ensure that there is sufficient money available to cover the cost of their funeral. In addition to funeral insurance, other types of funeral products include prepaid funerals and funeral bonds. Funeral insurance is sold directly to consumers and is a type of life insurance. There are two types of funeral insurance, funeral life insurance and funeral expenses insurance. In general terms, when a consumer purchases funeral life insurance, they nominate a chosen benefit amount such as $5,000, $10,000 or $15,000. The sum insured is typically much lower than for other life insurance products, as it is intended only to cover the cost of a funeral and burial or cremation. The consumer makes regular payments to the provider of the funeral insurance. Premiums are generally payable fortnightly, monthly or annually. On the event of the death of the person insured, if it occurs during the period of the policy, the benefit amount is paid to a nominated beneficiary who can spend the money however they choose. This differs from funeral expenses insurance. Here, the benefit paid is an indemnity for funeral expenses up to a specified limit. This means that if an insured person has nominated, nominated a limit of $15,000, and has paid premiums in accordance with this amount, but the funeral only costs $8,000, the insurer will only pay $8,000. In 2014, most funerals cost somewhere between four and $15,000. Despite the low sum insured, the cost of most funeral insurance coverage is relatively high, due in part to features such as an absence of full underwriting. Some funeral insurance policies have fixed premiums, but most do not. Therefore, the total costs paid for funeral insurance cover generally depends on how long the person lives after acquiring the insurance. Funeral insurance products in Australia typically have the following features. The premium payable depends on the age and sometimes gender of the applicant and the sum insured. Applicants are not usually subject to health or medical checks. There are often restrictions on when benefits are payable in the first 12 to 24 months of a policy. For example, benefits are often payable during this period for accidental death only. Similar to other types of life insurance, the premiums are ongoing and often stepped. That is, they often increase as the consumer ages although in some policies premiums cease after the person reaches a specified age. The sum insured also usually automatically increases in line with CPI or a fixed amount, such as 5%. The insured person can sometimes opt out of automatic sum insured increases. And premiums are not refundable if the insured person stops making payments or cancels the policy. As we will see from the case studies, 
This feature often means that consumers are hesitant to cancel funeral insurance policies as they may have already paid significant amounts of money for the policy and stand to lose it all if the policy is cancelled. As at the 30th of June 2014, there were a total of 437,274 active funeral insurance policies covering 743,421 insured lives. In the 2014 financial year, there were a total of 12,648 funeral insurance claims accepted by insurers. Over 103 million was paid out in claims, with an average payout of $8,143. This was a significant increase on the previous year, in which 61.6 .6 million was paid out in total. The amount paid out by insurers was around 33% of the value of premiums collected over the same period. In the 2013 financial year, the value of claims paid was 20% of premiums collected. During the 2014 financial year, a total of 72,091 funeral insurance policies were cancelled representing a lapse rate of 16.5% of total active policies. Notably, the rate of cancellations as a proportion of new policies was 80%. Nearly 65% of cancellations were initiated by consumers, while in the remainder of cases, the insurer cancelled the policy due to non-payment of premiums. About 16% of cancellations occurred during a cooling off period, which is often 30 days, while a further 39% occurred during the remainder of the first year of the policy. About 55% of cancellations therefore occurred during the first year. According to most insurers, the main reason for policy cancellations is the cost of the policy. Nearly two thirds 65.2% of active policies had been held for less than three years. Only 17.5% had been held for five years or longer, with just 4.7% held for longer than eight years. ASIC has regulatory responsibility for the conduct and disclosure obligations of issuers of funeral insurance. ASIC's investigations into the industry have found that People who bought funeral insurance generally found out about the product through television advertisements. People who bought funeral insurance generally selected from a small number of insurance providers. Most people with funeral insurance policies had not thought to calculate the total cost or to estimate likely costs under the policy. Most consumers held policies with stepped premiums where premiums increased as the person aged. Average annual premiums quadrupled for consumers aged over 50, rising from $336 for those aged 50 to 54 to $1,344 for those aged 80 to 84. Despite the overall decline in new policies between the 2013 and 14 financial years, Nine insurers reviewed by ASIC received a total of nearly 315 million in premiums for the 2014 financial year, an increase of about 9% on the previous year. And as I've indicated, ASIC found that most funerals cost somewhere between four and $15,000. For the policies reviewed, the average sum issued, sum insured was 8,859. For new policies, the average sum insured rose to $10,631, nearly 13% or 92,532 people were covered for an amount in excess of $15,000. The regulation of funeral insurance differs depending on whether the particular insurance product is a funeral life insurance product or a funeral expenses insurance product. Both funeral life insurance products and expenses insurance products 
are life policies under the Life Insurance Act. They are also contracts of life insurance under the Insurance Contracts Act. The consumer protection legislation in Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act includes funeral life insurance as a financial product, but does not include funeral expenses insurance. Issuers of funeral life insurance products are therefore subject to the requirements imposed by Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, whereas issuers of funeral expenses insurance products are not. Chapter 7 requires entities to act in certain ways when providing financial services pursuant to Australian financial services licences, including doing all things necessary to ensure that the financial services are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly, complying with the financial services laws, taking reasonable steps to ensure that their representatives comply with the financial services laws, maintaining the competence to provide financial services, ensuring that their representatives are properly trained and competent to provide the financial services, to have a dispute resolution system for services to a retail client and to have arrangements for compensating retail clients for loss or damage suffered because of breaches to financial services law. Funeral insurance products are also subject to the consumer protection regime contained in Part 2, Division 2 of the ASIC Act, although the applicability of this regime to funeral expenses insurance policies appears less than clear-cut. ASIC has regulatory uh, responsibility uh, for the issuers of funeral insurance, but ASIC does not have a product intervention power. Therefore, if conduct is not misleading, ASIC does not have powers to prevent funeral insurance products from being sold in situations where consumers may pay more insur in insurance premiums over a long period than the benefit that will be available under the policy, or have to cancel a policy due to unaffordable premiums, despite having paid premiums over a long period and potentially in excess of the benefit available under the policy. Another topic that will be considered in the course of this round of hearings is bank fees. Fees are imposed by banks on customers in respect of a number of financial products, including loans, credit cards and <coughs> transaction or deposit accounts in accordance with the terms of those products. The focus in these hearings will be on fees that are imposed in relation to the terms of transaction or deposit accounts. Fees imposed on deposit accounts can include fees for use of an ATM, of a different bank or provider, monthly account fees, overdrawn fees and dishonour fees, which are fees payable when a direct debit from an account is unable to be completed. <coughs> Some financial institutions offer an account which has low fees or no fees for customers. Accounts with fee-free features are sometimes referred to as basic accounts. A basic account provides eligible customers with an account into which they can receive their government benefit payment and access free banking transactions. Basic accounts might offer no account keeping fees, free monthly statements, no minimum deposit amounts and no overdrawn fees. The Reserve Bank conducts an annual survey on bank fees, which provides information on the fees earned by banks through their Australian operations. The 2016 survey, published in June last year, included 16 institutions, being 90% of the Australian banking sector by balance sheet size. Fee income from deposits for the 16 institutions in the, in the 2016 financial year was $1,104 million, down from $1,109 million in 2015. Banks reported that the decline in fee income was due to more fee waivers, reduced ATM charges owing to customers' increased use of contactless payments technology and FPOS cash out options, and reduced balance inquiries arising from increased use of mobile banking applications. 
As we will see later in this opening, these developments often do not assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers living in remote communities. We turn to the regulation of bank accounts and particularly transaction accounts. Bank practices are subject to a number of different, commonly overlapping legal regimes. These regimes include general or judge-made law, including contract law, the ASIC Act, which contains prohibitions against misleading or deceptive conduct, unconscionable conduct and unfair contract terms, and the Australian Consumer Law in Schedule 2 of the Competition and Consumer Act, which applies to the supply of goods and services to consumers. The practices of financial services entities in respect of transaction accounts, including the handling of informal overdrafts and fees, are also self-regulated by codes to which these entities are signatories. As you have heard in previous hearings, the Code of Banking Practice contains guidance around industry standards. It is a voluntary code published by the ABA that has been adopted by most banks offering retail products in Australia. The ABA has also developed an Indigenous Statement of Commitment, which outlines efforts to enhance financial inclusion, banking support and access to basic bank accounts and services for Indigenous consumers. The ABA released the first Indigenous Statement of Commitment in 2007 and it was revised in July 2015. The current version of the Banking Code was published in 2013. As you have heard previously, in December 2017, the ABA lodged the new Draft Banking Code of Practice with ASIC for approval. An updated version of the new draft code was provided to ASIC in April this year. We will refer to some of the relevant provisions in the new draft code shortly. Since 2014, the code has included a general clause concerning customers in remote Indigenous communities. Pursuant to Clause 8, subscribers to the code are required to provide special assistance to members of these communities. This clause provides that if a consumer is a member of a remote Indigenous community, subscribers must take reasonable steps to make information about banking services that may be relevant to the consumer available in an accessible manner. At the consumer's request, provide details of accounts which may be suitable to the consumer's needs, including in a remote location. This information may include details of accounts which attract no or low standard fees and charges. To assist the consumer with meeting identification requirements, having regard to the obligations of the bank under the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act. Appropriately trained staff who are regularly dealing with consumers in a remote location to be culturally aware and to consider publicly announced key Commonwealth, state and territory government programs, such as income management programs, that may be relevant in providing banking services to the consumer. A customer can refer an alleged code breach by a subscribing bank to an independent compliance monitoring body, the Code Compliance Monitoring Committee, or to the bank's external dispute for resolution scheme, such as FOS, if the customer has suffered a loss and is not satisfied with the bank's internal dispute resolution. As we have noted, the Code of Banking Practice is currently in the process of being revised following an independent review, which was completed in February last year. The independent reviewer was provided with examples of insufficient support for vulnerable customers, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and recommended broadening Clause 8 to apply more generally to that group, that is, not necessarily only people living in remote communities. The reviewer also recommended that Clause 8 of the Code be redrafted to make the obligations on signatory banks more meaningful and clearer. The draft code contains a new provision, Clause 35, dealing specifically with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. 
Clause 35 requires that if a person tells the subscriber that they are an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander customer, the subscriber will take reasonable steps to make information about their banking services accessible to them. They will also tell those customers about any accounts and services that are relevant to them, tell them about any accounts or services that have no or low standard fees, and help them meet any identification requirements. The draft code also contains clauses requiring subscribers to raise awareness of the basic, that is low or no fee, banking products that they may offer, to take reasonable steps to make information about banking services accessible to customers in remote communities, including remote Indigenous communities, to provide cultural awareness training to staff who regularly assist customers in remote Indigenous communities, and to train their staff to treat diverse and vulnerable customers with sensitivity, respect and compassion. A further topic that we will explore in the case studies is informal overdrafts. An overdraft is an arrangement that allows a person to withdraw more funds than they have in their account. There are two types of overdraft, one being an arranged or formal overdraft and the other an unarranged or informal overdraft. An arranged overdraft is a credit facility connected to a bank, building society or credit account which a person applies for or which may be given to a person as part of the account. In contrast, an unarranged or informal overdraft occurs if a person makes a payment but there are insufficient funds in the person's bank account to cover it. In that circumstance, where the person's bank honours the payment anyway, this creates a debt. While financial services entities have different policies in relation to unarranged overdrafts, many cheque or savings accounts permit some form of unarranged <laughs> overdraft to take place. Penalty fees for exceeding a person's available balance can be anywhere from $10 to $30. Some banks do not charge a penalty fee, but impose a penalty interest rate on the overdrawn amount. Unlike formal credit products, the amount overdrawn, plus the penalty fee, is usually repayable immediately. The Department of Human Services, the Department of Veterans Affairs and representative bodies have developed and endorsed a code of operation that applies to the recovery of debts from a person receiving an income support payment or veterans affairs payment. The code of operation applies to the recovery of debts that arise from customers' accounts where no repayment arrangement already exists and applies to bank practices in respect of informal overdrafts. The code of operation is endorsed by the ABA for member banks and is a non-legally binding statement of best practice between the Department of Human Services, the Department of Veterans Affairs and the representative bodies on behalf of relevant ADI members. Pursuant to the Code of Operation, the default position is that a customer should be able to retain at least 90% of their income support payment or Veterans Affairs payments in any fortnightly period. Where the ADI is unable to contact the customer about the debt, the maximum repayment amount that may be deducted from the customer's fortnightly payment will be the amount equal to 10% of that fortnightly payment. If the ADI does not contact the customer or is unsuccessful after reasonable efforts have been made, the ADI may determine a deduction amount that is no more than 10% of the customer's fortnightly payment. Alternatively, an ADI may freeze the account in cases where reasonable efforts to contact the customer or their authorised agent have been unsuccessful. A frozen account must be reinstated as soon as the customer makes contact to arrange for the repayment of the debt. The ADI may contact the customer or vice versa and negotiate a payment arrangement for any amount agreed between them, subject to the following. The ADI will not require repayments that are greater than 10% of the customer's fortnightly income support payment or veterans affairs payment 
without first establishing that a higher amount is reasonable and appropriate in the customer's circumstances. When considering if a repayment amount of greater than 10% of the customer's fortnightly payment is reasonable and appropriate, the ADI may consider factors including the customer's needs, taking into account that the intent of income support payments is to ensure access to essential items such as basic food and shelter and the need to maintain this for welfare recipients. Uh, the ADI may also consider any prior deductions from the customer's income support payment or veterans affairs payment and where a debt exceeds the usual payment being credited to the customer's account the ADI will consider, in accordance with this code, future payments as recovery of the debt. And finally, they may consider any other special circumstances which may impact on a customer's ability to repay the debt. Having determined an appropriate amount for repayment, the ADI will deduct that amount from each fortnightly payment made to the customer by Human Services or Veterans Affairs until the debt is paid. An arrangement between an ADI and a customer in respect of repayment of debts will be recorded by the ADI. The record will also include details of any disagreement between the customer and the ADI and the advice given to the customer on his or her rights and further avenues for resolution of the disagreement. A customer or their authorised agent is able to request a copy of the repayment arrangement and that the ADI reviews the repayment arrangement should the circumstances of the customer change. Where a customer believes that their ADI has not complied with the Code of Operation, they can invoke the internal dispute resolution process of the ADI. And if the dispute cannot be resolved to the customer's satisfaction by their ADI, they can take their complaint to an external dispute resolution scheme of which the ADI is a member. We will see in these hearings that the code of operation is important for some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who receive income support payments. In some circumstances, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people may not have understood that they had an overdraft facility and the terms on which it was provided. We turn to the information provided to the Commission by financial services entities about their services and practices relating to their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. In response to a letter from the Commissioner asking financial services entities to identify cases of misconduct and conduct practices, behaviour or activity that has fallen below community standards and expectations, only a small number of entities disclosed conduct relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This may in part be because financial services entities do not generally collect information about whether their customers identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. We will summarise some aspects of the responses and statements received from the entities in respect of their interactions with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We start with ANZ. ANZ provided two statements to the Commission from Tony Tapsell, General Manager, Retail Branch Network, Northern Queensland and the Northern Territory. ANZ told the Commission that it operates branches and agencies in 19 remote communities in Australia and that it does not generally record the race or ethnicity of its customers. ANZ told the Commission about its operations on Groot Island where ANZ has an agency and operates a 24-hour ANZ fee-free ATM. ANZ offers a fee-free everyday transaction account to customers receiving certain government benefits called an ANZ Access Basic Account. This is an account commonly used by customers living on Groot Island. ANZ told the Commission that it offers two formal overdraft facilities ANZ Assured and ANZ Personal Overdrafts. Informal overdraft arrangements are available on a variety of ANZ retail transaction accounts. ANZ told the Commission that in response to the Code of Operation applicable to the recovery of debts, it has implemented what are known as 90% arrangements, 
which are available to ANZ customers who receive specified payments from Human Services or Veterans Affairs into an ANZ transaction account. The key features of the 90% arrangements are ANZ can apply no more than 10% of the payments to reduce the overdrawn amount, including related fees and interest, with the consequence that the customer is able to withdraw the remaining 90%. The customer can only withdraw funds over the counter at a branch or agency. Any interest and fees applied to the overdrawn amount may be reversed. And once the overdrawn amount is repaid, these arrangements are removed. ANZ told the Commission that if a staff member becomes aware that a customer with an overdrawn account was receiving specified payments from Human Services or Veterans Affairs, the staff member will generally suggest to the customer that the 90% arrangements be put in place on their account. Mr Tapsell will give evidence in the Commission this week about informal overdrafts and about ANZ's low fee and fee-free accounts. We turn to Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, which we will refer to as Bendigo Bank. Bendigo Bank have provided a statement from Robert Musgrove, the executive, Engagement Innovation at Bendigo Bank. Bendigo Bank told the Commission that it has many customers living in regional and remote communities, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. However, the bank does not collect data from its customers that identifies whether or not they are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. Bendigo Bank operates 608 branches, including community bank branches and agencies, and 720 ATMs across Australia. Of these, 374 branches and agencies and 358 ATMs are located in regional and remote communities. Bendigo Bank told the Commission that since 2012, it has been a participant in the fee-free ATMs in Remote Indigenous Communities initiative, facilitated by the ABA. Bendigo Bank told the Commission that it has certain practices or procedures by which it may refrain from applying fees and charges. For example, where a requested direct debit transaction would put an account with no overdraft facility into a debit balance which is sufficiently small, the bank will often allow the transaction to proceed with no overdrawn fee. By way of further example, where an account incurs a dishonour fee as a result of having had insufficient funds to enable a requested direct debit to be transacted, and the dishonour fee then causes the account to become overdrawn, it is the bank's practice not to apply an overdrawn account fee in addition to the dishonour fee. In his statement, Mr Musgrove responded to the situation of a particular Bendigo Bank customer who had repeatedly been charged overdrawn fees of $21.50 and dishonour fees of $40 over a period of time. We turn next to CBA. CBA has provided a statement from Sean Lewis, Executive General Manager, Direct Channels within Retail Banking Services of CBA. CBA told the Commission about its Indigenous Customer Assistance Line, or ICAL. ICAL's purpose is to provide support to geographically isolated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers who would otherwise not be able to access a CBA branch or online services to conduct their day-to-day -day banking. ICAL provides free balance inquiries, replacement cards, access to funds and general support to assist customers with their banking requirements. ICAL employs a specialised identification process for remote customers to enable the delivery of account opening and other services. CBA currently supports 90 remote communities through its ICAL service. In 2009, CBA identified that remote customers were relying on third-party owned ATMs to retrieve their account balances and were incurring <coughs> significant fees from those providers as a result. CBA launched ICAL on the 25th of May 2009. To address the fees associated with account balances, 
the launch of iCal was focused around educating customers to telephone for their account balance rather than using ATMs. CBA told the Commission that customers have access to ATM services in remote communities through the ATM fee-free agreement, which has been operating since May 2012. CBA recently identified that there have been instances where CBA customers incurred fees using the ATMs owned and operated by third parties under the ATM fee-free agreement. CBA told the Commission that it is working to identify the number of customers affected, that it will ensure the fees are refunded and that it will continue to work with the ABA and third party ATM providers to ensure this does not happen again. CBA also told the Commission that financial assistance centres in remote Indigenous communities had raised concerns with ASIC in relation to the difficulties that some customers had faced completing the identification process. CBA told the Commission that it is working on ways to overcome these difficulties and encourage further engagement. We turn next to the Traditional Credit Union, or TCU. TCU is an unlisted public company limited by shares registered under the Corporations Act. TCU provided a statement from Anthony Hampton, its Chief Executive Officer. TCU told the Commission that it has branches in 14 remote communities in the Northern Territory, in addition to branches in Darwin, Catherine and Alice Springs. It owns and operates 31 ATMs across the Territory, which are mainly located at remote communities where there is a TCU branch. In 2017, 80% of its members lived in remote communities. The vast majority of TCU members living in these communities are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. TCU told the Commission that its business model is fundamentally different from that of other ADIs because TCU relies on fee income rather than interest income. TCU's net interest income is very small compared to its transaction and account fee income. TCU's low net interest income means there is little capacity for TCU to cross subsidised branch and ATM networks. Because of this, TCU transaction fees and charges are relatively high compared to those of other ADIs. For example, TCU told the Commission that it charges a weekly account service fee of $5 for an everyday account and a monthly account fee of $10 for a budget account and a loan saving account. A cash withdrawal fee of $5 per withdrawal is charged for cash withdrawals at a branch in relation to certain accounts. TCU charges members an overdrawn account fee of $20 and $30 for the dishonour of a direct debit or cheque. TCU members are not charged a fee for cash withdrawals or for checking an account balance from TCU-owned ATMs. We turn finally to Westpac. Westpac provided a submission to the Commission in which it acknowledged that ASIC had raised concerns in 2015 about its provision of car loans to two Indigenous customers in remote communities. Westpac considered that these loans were unsuitable for the customers and should not have been approved. The loans were entered into in around February 2010 and July 2012 <coughs> by Capital Finance Australia Limited prior to it being acquired by Westpac in December 2013. Westpac was of the view that the identified conduct, at least in part, could be attributed to insufficient control over the implementation of policy, process or changes to policy or process by third parties. Westpac waived all amounts owing under the loans and ensured that neither customer had a default listing against their name in respect of the loans. Westpac told the Commission that it has undertaken a review of a sample of regional accounts in a serious arrears position to identify any car finance responsible lending issues. 
In addition to receiving and analysing the submissions and statements received from these and other entities, the Commission issued 43 notices to produce documents to 18 entities. These notices yielded close to 17,000 documents about various aspects of financial services entities' practices, procedures and conduct, both generally and in particular cases. We turn now to the particular case studies through which the conduct of financial services entities in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will be addressed. The first case study will examine the conduct of the Aboriginal Community Benefit Fund with respect to funeral insurance plans that it offers to customers throughout Australia, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. The Commission will hear evidence from Tracy Walsh an Aboriginal woman, about her dealings with ACBF both prior to and following her signing up for an ACBF plan. The Commission will also hear evidence from Bryn Jones, a current director of ACBF. The second case study will examine the practices of select AFSL in selling funeral insurance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. The Commission will hear evidence from Cathy Marika, a Yolngu woman who grew up in northeastern Arnhem Land, about her experience in being sold funeral insurance policies which she did not understand and could not afford, and her experience in respect of the referral sales program in use by Select at that time. The third case study will examine the conduct of ANZ in connection with the fee-free and low-fee accounts it offers to customers living in remote communities, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. The Commission will hear evidence from T. Doe, a senior family support worker at Save the Children. Ms Doe will explain the difficulties experienced by one of her clients, an Aboriginal woman from a remote community, when trying to open a no-fee account at the Catherine ANZ branch. The final case study will examine the conduct of ANZ in connection with the provision of formal and informal overdrafts to customers living in remote communities, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. The Commission will hear evidence from Mr Phil Bowden, a financial counsellor at Anglicare Northern Territory about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers who have been granted overdrafts by ANZ. As we have already indicated, the Commission will also hear evidence from Tony Tapsell, the General Manager, Retail Branch Network, Northern Queensland and Northern Territory. Commissioner, tomorrow morning, before moving to these case studies, we intend to call two witnesses with experience working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional communities. Those witnesses are Mrs. Mrs. Linda Edwards of Financial Counselling Australia and Mr. Nathan Boyle of ASIC. That concludes the opening statement, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Ms. Orr. Uh, what time tomorrow? 10. 10 o'clock should be fine. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> I hope. We're going soft in the Territory, are we, Ms. Hall? <laughs> uh, 10 o'clock it is then. Thank you, Commissioner.